I think we are on chapter 20 and 5. Yes, page 115. And what we're going to be talking about in this chapter, screw tape letters, concerns the same old thing. Same old thing is kind of the uh, key to the chapter. And for our study tonight, we're going to look at two thoughts of Mr. Lewis. That, of course, he ascribes the, these thoughts to the world below. So let's get started. My dear Wormwood, the real trouble <clears throat> about the set your patient is living in is that it is merely italicized. It is merely Christian. Well, he has another book, does he not, entitled what? Mere, Mere Christianity. Yeah. As a matter of fact, that was the book through the Holy Spirit's influence that um, was the avenue that converted Nixon's so-called Watergate hatchet man, Charles Colson, on a little vacation up on the coast of Maine. That one book was what converted Chuck Colson. Yes, mere Christianity. And what does he mean by mere? Well, he means basic Christianity. John Stott has a book entitled that. They're about the same shape and size and format and everything. Basic Christianity. Simple Christianity. Unfettered Christianity. Uh, a Christianity without additions to it. But pure Christianity. But in his list of additions, those additions to which he is opposed, at the bottom of this page, his denominational precepts cause him to draw a very crooked line that I hope you'll take note of. They all have individual interests, of course, but the bond remains mere Christianity. In other words, they can come from a different political... My, it's echoing in here, isn't it? A different political or educational background or whatever. And the bond of simple, basic, mere, unfettered Christianity will be that which brings unity. What we want, if men become Christians at all, and of course that's the problem that they've got here. They've got a man who's already become a Christian. So what we want, if they become Christians at all, is to keep them in the state of what I call Christianity and. Now, let's take a look at his additions here. We're, we're going to see what Mr. Lewis is saying, but I doubt we'll even get to reading, you know, even probably half of the chapter. I don't know, because it all is pretty much the same. He's way off his rocker in what he's trying to prove here. You know, Christianity and the crisis. Now you can trace all these in history. Mr. Lewis is talking about something specific here. Christianity and the new psychology. I know people like Jung. Uh, Christianity and B.F. Skinner. Christianity and the new order. Christianity and faith healing. Christianity and psychical research. Christianity and vegetarianism. And it gets worse as you go along here. Christianity and spelling reform. <laughs> in other words, get people interested in Christianity, but not just Christianity or merely Christianity or Christianity and that's all and Christianity for its own sake. But, oh, now that we're involved in Christianity, now we'll use Christianity to get involved in another area. Like, uh, we could even bring it up to closer, closer to home, Christianity and the Christian ERA movement. Because you could use the Bible to say, well, see, Jesus came and set free all the women of his day by, you know, having a lot of them appear and work, you know, in the Gospels and around his ministry and so forth. So then you could use the Bible to ride your hobby horse of women in liberation, ERA. Well, in his, in his list of additions, or in his list of phrases, let's say, all of the phrases, the bottom of page 115, begin with the word Christianity. Or we could say the words Christianity and. And, in his opinion, what is held in common among the second members of each phrase? What is held in common? What's the common denominator among all the second members of the phrase? Well, the, the characteristic of unscripturalness. It's not a part of mere Christianity. The characteristic of unscripturalness when it comes to the nature of mere biblical Christianity. But one member stands out oddly as not belonging to the second group, but rather the first. It's not a spelling reform or vegetarianism. I won't give you all the guesses now. I'm headed backwards on the list. Or psychical research. 
Yes, it is faith healing. Why? Because faith healing belongs to part of mere Christianity. Notice how he throws this in there with spelling reform and spiritualism as an addition to Christianity. And the common denominator among all these members being the characteristic, in his mind anyway, and he's ascribing all this to the world below, of unscripturalness, faith healing. So let's talk about this for a moment. I mean, he's opposed to faith healing. and He's saying that it's an addition to Christianity. And, and of course, screw tape, Lewis is saying through screw tape, that, that screw tape is the one who has originated all of this, or other demons. You know, if we can get a man involved in Christianity, let's get involved in Christianity and something. The Christianity would be from above. The and would be from below. And so he drives a wedge here between Christianity and one of its basic tenets, according to the New Testament, which is faith healing. Now, you, also, you often see this in another way, divine healing. Divine healing. Perhaps divine healing doesn't carry with it the shock waves that the first phrase does, faith healing, because you have these images of Elmer Gantries and so forth, and modern-day Peter Popoffs and so forth with faith healing. So perhaps divine healing is, is a um, more shock-proof term, and perhaps it's a more comprehensive term. It certainly, it would include faith, or of course in some people's minds maybe it doesn't include faith, but I've actually heard some people, even in the faith movement or even in the charismatic walk, uh, disclaim this title, faith healing, you know, 100% in favor of divine healing. Well, listen to what the Christian documents have to say. If you want to open your Bible and take a look at these passages, Matthew chapter 9 and verse 22. I thought about the matter. I mean, this stands out to me right away. And so would, you know, a whole lot of other words that he might throw in here as an addition to Christianity. He, him being opposed to it. He's opposed to it. Faith healing. It's an addition. It's not mere Christianity. It's not unfettered. It's fettered Christianity. It's a later addition, an unscriptural addition. Faith healing. Have you ever thought about that phrase? What do you, I mean, what, what comes over you with that phrase, faith healing? Well, let's don't listen to the word of some man or some creed, but what do our, as well as Mr. Lewis's, too bad he didn't know about it, but that's his own fault. Our Christian documents say about it. Matthew 9, 22. Here in this case, to a woman with an incurable blood condition, Jesus said, Daughter, be of good comfort. Thy faith hath made thee whole. And did it? Well, the answer is yes, if we believe the Bible. The woman was made whole from that hour. And what made her whole? It wasn't God's grace or it wasn't whatever we want to put in there. It was her faith. And what was the wholeness? Her healing. So I guess you could juxtapose those two words then, faith healing, and it would be biblical. Same chapter, 29th verse. Two blind men came to Jesus, and to them he said what? According to your faith. In other words, two men who needed healing came to him, and he said, According to your faith, be it unto you, and their eyes were opened. In Mark 2, verses 5 and following, of a lame sinner and his carriers, the man sick of the palsy and born of four, as the KJV said, we read, When Jesus saw their faith, Mark 2, 5, when he did what? When he saw their faith, he said unto the sick of palsy, because this was more to the point, because of the people present, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. And if you read along, he went on to say, Paul, also I say to you, Arise, take up thy bed, and go thy way into thine house. We have to go back to that fifth verse. What did he see in them? Their faith. Now, of course, I'm majoring on this because of Mr. Lewis's problem with his phrase here, faith healing. What else would you get out of those three scriptures right there but faith healing? People needed healing, and how did they get it? According to your faith, be it unto you. Your faith has made you whole. They needed healing, and faith is what brought it. What else can you get but faith healing? That doesn't sound like an extra addition to the Bible. It's there just as clear as black print on white pages can be. And yet, because I say of his own denominational presuppositions, what 
theologians and philosophers call precepts because of his own denominational precepts. They don't call them denominational. I put that word in there. Denominational precepts, he's forced to not see the word of God clearly and as a result draw a very crooked line at the bottom of this page with his list of phrases, Christianity and. They all sound good. I like the rest of them. Vegetarianism, spelling reform, the new psychology, you know, all these inventions of the world below. Rightly so. That's what screw tape is claiming. And then I get faith healing. The devil doesn't heal people. I mean, what's going on? I thought I read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The devil never healed a person there. Screw tape never ministered healing to a soul there. Faith healing. Faith did the healing, and God is the one who did the healing. Now, right after I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the truth of divine healing, still a part of our Presbyterian church, we just hadn't had time to... Uh, make all the transitions that were necessary to move out to greener pastures, much greener, <laughs> the old dry husks of man's religion that were found there. But our pastor took it upon himself to preach a little sermon addressed to some of the younger members of the congregation, those of us in our mid to late teens, who were believing all of this business. He preached a message on, of all things, entitled Grace Healing. Grace Healing. <laughs> You know, they want to water down with all of that sentimentalism, you know, put all the responsibility back at the door of heaven rather than the door of man. So we don't have to say, well, the reason I didn't get it is because of my unbelief. You know, that way you can always say, well, it just wasn't God's will. So we're back to that old abomination. Well, if it's thy will, heal me. And if it's not, give me the grace to bear like you gave Paul the grace to bear that sickness that you gave him over in 2 Corinthians 12. And one deception just leads to another. You see, as soon as you open your mind to one deception, it just multiplies itself like rabbits in the theological arena of your mind. You just can't see the light. You can't see clearly after that. Grace healing, yes. And then he, he proceeded to demonstrate, of course, it wasn't from the Word. Because the Word doesn't teach grace healing. I mean, if you want to get I mean, really technical about it, we could teach on grace breathing and grace getting out of bed and grace everything. It's because of God's grace that you do anything, that anything good happens. So that's mudding the waters. That's a smoke screen for what the real issue is here. He said, now there are some people, some of us knew who those some were. There are some people going around of late... <laughs> who believe that God heals by faith. He said, there's not a verse in the Bible that says that healing ever came by faith. Well, you can tell he, what he hadn't been doing for the last 20 years, <laughs> namely reading the Bible. He said, there is not, I, you just can't believe that people who are paid, I mean, they're professional. <laughs> Garbage collectors is what they should be, who are paid to minister God's word to us. Make a statement like that. He said there's not a, <laughs> a person like that doesn't deserve an audience. I always say that you don't deserve an audience when you don't know the subject material any better than that. Some of us who were, well, you could divide his age probably by about three or four, maybe five. He was an older fella. You could divide his age by five and we knew more than he knew about the word of God. Was it pride? It was just the truth. If it's the truth, it's the truth. You can't help it if it's, if it's good about you and bad about someone else. He said there's not a verse in the Bible that said healing ever came by faith. He said, no. He said, all the time. <laughs> you kept wanting to ask him, which version is it that you're reading from? <laughs> all the times people got healed, he said, the Bible teaches clearly they were healed by grace. You know, he stuck on that Ephesians 2, 9, by grace we're saved, and it's by grace everything for him. And I can, I can tell you why. It's because it takes the responsibility away from our door and puts it at God's door. We never have to deal with, as some of these theologians are saying, you know, heaping all of this guilt and condemnation on people by telling them the reason that you didn't get healed was because you didn't have faith. That's exactly what the New Testament teaches us. We read in Mark chapter 6, after Jesus had gone back to his hometown Nazareth, that he could not there do any mighty works. Why? Because of their unbelief. And we're told that he marveled. He marveled in a nice appropriate orthodox Jewish town, Nazareth of Galilee. There was so much unbelief and such an absence of faith that he could not do any mighty work there save lay his hands on a few sick folk, I believe we read in Mark chapter 6. You can't even do that in churches today. That's the level of faith they have compared to Nazareth of old. You couldn't even get a few people healed there. 
So I guess I would put that pastor and this writer before us here just about in the same boat. <laughs> a pastor and a well-known writer, C.S. Lewis, in the same boat, disclaimers in this area of faith healing when that is clearly what the Word of God teaches. Now, I have a book that has just been published two months ago. That's how fresh off the press it is, October of this year, and I just got my copy in the mail yesterday. It was advertised, should I say the name, I guess I always do, so I might as well not break that tradition now. It was advertised with the title, Jacuzzi Religion. Jacuzzi Religion. <laughs> and um, then when it got to me, they had toned it down, not much, but they had toned it down to Hot Tub Religion. <laughs> That's about the same thing, of course. Maybe they thought people would know what Jacuzzi meant. So Hot Tub, we know what that means. Subtitle and other thoughts it's an interesting book and i knew what it was going to be about and other thoughts on christian living in the material world you know hot tub religion you know religion in a materialistic secularistic society so you know i knew what it was going to be about and it sounds good it happens to have been written by um whom i may refer to as the best selling um theologian by profession, I mean an, an actual theologian, not some lay writer or something, J.I. Packer. He has written book after book after book, which are written on layman's terms and are just best-selling books. The eighth out of ten chapters in this book is entitled Poor Health. Poor Health. You know it's going to be poor gospel also in this chapter. Poor health. Now, what he has in mind here are all those people, and they're getting increasing media attention now, the faith people, the faith healers, the name it and claim it, the, you know, all the aspects of, of the charismatic movement, you know, any spectrum of that. And I just thought I'd bring this along and lead, read a little of it to you, because to get back to what the connection would be, Yes, Lewis and others would notice those couple of references we gave you in Matthew chapter 9 and Mark 2 and the healings in Jesus' ministry. They say, yes, but the problem with you taking that argument any beyond that is because that was Jesus who did the healing. He doesn't authorize us to. That was something special during his ministry. Now listen to some of these arguments. They're good old typical denom, denominational, denom for short, denom arguments here. They don't make sense at all. Poor health. And I like this first sentence here. It's something that the Reformed people, as well as... Here's one place where the Reformed people would sit down to breakfast with the dispensational. Poor health over divine healing, or uh, theology of divine sickness, I should say, has been a fact of life since the fall. Now, that prepares you for the thrust here of the arm. Well, it's a fact of life. It's just going to be here, and so there's nothing we can do about it. You know, I find it interesting. They always use that argument. Well, it's a result of the fall, with the meaning being, you know, we can't do anything about it. It's just a part of the fall. And yet they never use that argument concerning sin. Sin is a result of the fall, too. It's exactly the same. If you're going to use an argument against one, you'd, bound, you'd be bound to use it against the other. So your argument would be something like this. Well, sin came as a result of the fall. There's nothing we can do about it. It just comes upon us. We don't know why. It just comes upon us. They never use that concerning sin. They only use that concerning sickness. I find that to be very ironic and very interesting. Very confusing because you're not really faithful with the whole issue here. I mean, the point is, yes, it's true sin came as a result of the fall, but we don't just throw our hands up and surrender. We go back to the Word and know that the Word, even though we know that sin is a result of the fall and it's in the world because of the fall, the Word says, don't sin. And if you do, don't go to man or to a counselor. Go to God and be forgiven of it. Amen. Now, shouldn't we have some similar connections whenever it comes to this, the subject of sickness and healing then? Oh, but in their minds, evidently not. It's just a totally different God. issue. But they never see the inconsistencies of their logic here or their lack of it. Had there been no sin, there would be no sickness. Well, that's nice and cute. There'd be no sin. There'd be no sin had there been no fall. As it is, both are universal, the latter, sickness, being a penal result of the former, sin. Now he's kind of shifted it all away from the fall. So scripture implies, so too did yesterday's Christians view the matter. 
They did not find poor health. This is the very first page of the chapter. And chronic discomforts and obstacle to faith in God's goodness. Rather, now he says this was the attitude of yesterday's Christians. Well, maybe yesterday's, but not last year's Christians, though. Those of the first century. They expected illness. They accepted it uncomplainingly as they looked forward to the health of heaven. You don't find that in the New Testament. The Christians expecting sickness. He said, so it's, it's no wonder that Christians nowadays are so interested in divine healing. He said, these people and this, this theology, a new theology, he argues, it regularly presents itself as a rediscovery of what the church once knew and never should have forgotten about the power of faith to channel the power of Christ. To support itself from Scripture, this teaching uses three arguments. Number one, Jesus Christ, who heals so abundantly while on earth, has not changed. He has not lost his power. Whatever he did then, he can do now. Number two, salvation in Scripture is a holistic reality, embracing soul, spirit, and body. Thoughts of salvation for the soul only, without or apart from the body, are unbiblical. In other words, salvation is holistic. And by the way, we could kind of, I think, uh, tie a thought from Sunday morning into our place right here, and that concerns the intrusion of Greek philosophy and intellectualism into Christian theology in the third century A.D. And one thing the Greeks were known for, as the Hebrews were not, the Semitic people of the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, the Greeks were known for dividing man up into a body, soul, and spirit, claiming that the body was the prison house of the soul and that man was simply awaiting the death of the body for the escape of the soul. They're the ones who made all this division between body, soul, and spirit. And I think that's bled over into Christianity. So we see the soul of man, that's that intangible whatever that no one can really define. I'm saying no one out there in the church world can or even tries to. We see that that, that intangible soul of man, well, that was redeemed at the cross. Or maybe you would say the spirit of man was redeemed at the cross, and then the rest of man, well, it's just for the garbage you dump him. That's Greek philosophy that has split man up, saying, well, God saved this part of man, not the other part. That's far into the Hebrew way of thinking. And you say, well, the New Testament's written in Greek. Yes, it's written in Greek by Hebrew people, though. Almost everyone, almost without exception, who contributed something to the writing of the Word of God, Old or New Testament, were Jewish people by background exceptions being people like Luke. Third, here's the third argument, blessing is missed, that is healing is missed, where faith is lacking. So those are the three arguments he said often used to prove faith healing. Jesus still heals today because he did then. Salvation is of the whole man. And if you don't get healed or you're not blessed of God, it's because of your doubt or a worse term than that, your unbelief. Those are really two different terms as I trust you understand. Well, he said, all of this is true. Too bad that in the end of the yeah. chapter there. We know it's going to be a but, or nevertheless, or however. Jesus still does heal miraculously. Yes, as a matter of fact, I think on occasion he does. Oh, there's that warning word right away. O-C-C-A-S-I-O-N. I do not deny healing miracles today. But... It looks like these people are wrong in their theology. Their reasoning is wrong, cruelly, and destructively wrong. All right? He said, let's take a look at these three arguments. Look at them again. There's more to be said about each one of them. Now you'll see why I brought this book into play here with this first point. First argument was Christ healed back then. He's the same yesterday and today and forever. He can still heal and will still heal today. It is true that Christ's power... It's still what it was. However, the healings he performed when he was on earth had a special significance. Besides being works of mercy, they were signs of his messianic identity. That is false. That is wrong. That is probably one of the classic arguments, and I'll show you later how even if that were true, it still won't help that position at all. Because other people practice healing than just Jesus in the New Testament. So it, would, it wouldn't help the position anyway. But that is wrong. His healings didn't 
you often hear this, the reason Jesus healed, the reason behind, the purpose behind it was proof of his messianic identity, to prove that he was God, to prove his messiahship is why he healed. He even throws in here besides being works of mercy, so he has a sub-purpose also, that the compassion of God, God was merciful. Well, this is totally wrong and totally false. You, don't, you won't find a connection in the New Testament between all of the healings of Jesus, not an immediate connection between all of Jesus' healings and the, the thought that this is proof of his messianic identity. Um, we find over in Acts chapter 10 and verse 38 that Jesus was anointed of God with power and with the Holy Spirit, and he went about doing good, healing all were, who were oppressed of the devil. Um, he was healing them. If you want to know why he healed them, he healed them because they were sick. That's the reason that he healed them. That takes a lot of thinking to come up with that one, doesn't it? I should get extra pay this week for that. He healed them because he had need of healing. They were sick people. They were oppressed of the devil. Notice we're not told there in Luke's narrative, Acts 10.38, they were blessed of God. They were oppressed of the devil. The reason he healed them is because they were oppressed of the devil. Not to make some claim that he was God. And I'll come back to this point if I remember to here in a moment. Secondly, what about this business of holistic salvation? Well, he said, it's true that... Um, let's see, does he really say this? And there is indeed, as some put it, yes, he does, healing for the body and the atonement. But perfect physical health is not promised for this life. It is promised for heaven... It's another argument of the denoms <clears throat> as part of the resurrection glory that awaits us in the day when Christ will return and change our body. And so he gives this story. The wife of, in other words, if we want to then bring this over into the area of sin, then we kind of end up where they really are in this area of sin. And that is that Man has two natures, that the Christian has two natures. The new nature wants to serve God. The old nature hates God and loves the devil. And so you've kind of got a Christian schizophrenic on your hands going through life who has the old man living in him and the new man living in him, and, <clears throat> and he'll never really overcome sin in this life. And at best, he can be credited for striving against sin, but he'll never overcome sin, really never overcome any sin, any measurable uh, degree of overcoming sin in this life. But when he gets to heaven... He'll overcome sin. No, what you do when you go to heaven is you get to heaven. I mean, it's, it's automatic that sin is no longer there and, healing, and sickness is no longer there. That's automatic. You don't have to be told that. There'd be no need for healing in the atonement if you get it whenever you get in heaven. And same way, um, forgiveness being in the atonement if you get it when you get to heaven. There'd be no sense in it. You're just arguing around in a circle then. <coughs> And you've also got the eschatological problem, if this two-nature theory is right, with the uh, situation of what happens to the Christian whenever he dies. If he's got an old man, an old, unregenerate, apostate, rebellious, carnal, sin-filled man, what happens? You take half of him to heaven and throw the rest of them in hell? We know you can't take that which is sinful or apostate or satanic into heaven, so you'd have half of a man in heaven and half of them in hell. But then he gives us account. The wife of a pastor friend bore a, quote, miracle baby. That means one of these that you're supposed to claim. You know, that's what he means by that. After physicians had declared pregnancy impossible. But the child, so they got a miracle child, and here's the conclusion. They love to tell all these doom and gloom stories. Pass over six that it worked for to find two that it didn't work for. <clears throat> but the child was malformed and died within a week. And that's just supposed to just shock everyone. You know, you were, your spirits were lifted whenever you read there. They got a miracle baby. You know, conception took place when physicians said it was not possible. But then the child, he said, was malformed and died within a week. <clears throat> Preaching the following Sunday, my friend applied to this bereavement the truth that Christ's death does indeed secure <clears throat> bodily healing. God healed Joy Ann, he said, by taking her to heaven. Packer writes, exactly. No, that's not, he took her to heaven by taking her to heaven. You don't get healed by being taken to heaven. You get taken to heaven by being taken to heaven. And then what about this third argument? That you've got to have faith. 
we're back to Lewis's claim here of faith healing. He said, no, this doesn't work. Paul himself lived with a thorn in the flesh that went unhealed. 2 Corinthians 12, 7-9. Well, you're assuming a whole lot just in making the statement. You've assumed a whole lot without proving anything. That Paul himself lived with a thorn in the flesh. There's no doubt about that fact. That's what the scriptures say. He lived with a thorn in the flesh that went unhealed. Now, wait a minute. You've just superimposed your interpretation now on thorn in the flesh by calling it a sickness. That's what is uncalled for. And listen to some of these thoughts of his conclusion. <clears throat> this old theology of bankruptcy and divine sickness on earth. Some Christians today live with epilepsy, homosexual cravings, ulcers, and cyclical depressions that plunge them into deep waters of this kind from which there is no escape. Christians that live with homosexual cravings and cyclical depressions, epilepsy and ulcers from which there is no escape. <coughs> I would not have wanted to be the one who ended this chapter with this paragraph. We should certainly go to the doctor, use medication, and thank God for both. But it is equally certain that we should also go to the Lord. Dr. Jesus, as some call him, and ask what challenge, rebuke, or encouragement he might have for us regarding our sickness. You know, they, they are just like the disciples in their misunderstanding over in John 9. They think that every sickness is God trying to tell you something. You know, it's caused by some sin. And Jesus answers that in John 9. Neither this man sinned nor did his parents sin but that the works of God might be manifest in him, that God can get glory by his healing. God didn't get any glory by the blind man's blindness. So you're supposed to go to the doctor, use medicine, thank God for both of those two, and then pray to God and ask why you're sick. Lord, what challenge, rebuke, or encouragement? The challenge, rebuke, or encouragement you would hear if you were listening is, don't go to the doctor, don't use medicine, but trust me for healing. The reason you're sick is not necessarily because of sin. The reason you're sick is because the enemy is attacking you. And so here's how he ends. I thank God that I have known more than 40 years of excellent health, and I feel well as I write this. But it will not always be this way. My body is wearing out. What a confession. <clears throat> May I be given grace to recall and apply to myself the things I have written here when my own day of physical weakness comes, whether in the form of pain, paralysis, prostration, or whatever. And may the same blessing be yours also in your hour of need. And I said, I repudiate that. <laughs> now, he is the, I called him earlier, and I don't think too many people would dispute this, he's the leading writing theologian today. I mean, he is a theologian par excellence in his abilities. He's the world's leading authority on Puritanism in England as well as in America. Um, he is an excellent writer, and that's why books like this, Hot Tub Religion, are being written by him and sell thousands of copies. Perhaps his bestseller being Knowing God, which is quite a lay person's type of exposition of theology. But again, I think you pull the rug of credibility out from underneath yourself when you so quickly and so easily with just the drop of the pen deny the clear teachings of the New Testament. We'll come to something else in a moment and I'll remember to make the connection. Here's another article that I clipped out of a magazine. As a matter of fact, it was a letter to the editor. An earlier edition of this magazine had been on divine sickness, pain and suffering and what it meant for the Christian. And so this man from, we'll call him Gary L., from Madison Heights, Michigan, writes in, oh, he said, before I had the chance to turn to the pages in your issue, I knew by the cover what to expect inside. The articles that dealt with pain, suffering, sickness, so forth, were meant for my wife and me. My wife, Vanessa, was recently diagnosed with MS, multiple sclerosis, a disease of the central nervous system that causes loss of muscular coordination. Uh, she has difficulty walking, numbness, and a partial loss of vision. 
There is no cure for MS, and the medication has had minimal effect. After the diagnosis, Vanessa had a difficult time accepting the illness, and bitterness set in. Uh, but victory came whenever we were told the truth about divine sickness, and we read the articles in your magazine. He goes on to say, We pray every day and thank the Lord for our gracious, for gracious and loving people like you. Only God knows where we would be without your outpouring of love and guidance. Thank you for your magazine, for the most timely articles in your last issue. No matter what the disease is or personal loss or failure or disappointment that comes our way, and here's where he quotes scripture for the first time, we must take the words of the Apostle Paul to heart in Ephesians 6.10, be strong in the Lord. You can't be strong in the Lord when you're paralyzed with MS. That'd be one verse of anything you could use to get up off the bed from MS. Be strong in the Lord because I'm sick and about to die here and ascribing all of this back to God. It's all not just sickness, it's a theology of divine sickness that a lot of these people have. And we see it in Mr. Lewis's writing with his uh, throwing faith healing in with things like uh, psychical research and spelling reform. But you often hear people say, now, these accounts that we've looked at here in the Gospels, they don't work, they don't fit, because they were done before the church was founded or came into existence, so they don't apply to the church. They were done before the beginning of Christianity, and more specifically, they were done by Jesus Christ himself. Therefore, being done by him, they were to serve as proofs of the fact that he was God in the flesh. But the problem with that is we've got other verses in the New Testament that then go beyond the pre-Christian, pre-church days, that go beyond any ascribing them to Jesus as signs of his messianic identity, because we have, for instance, Acts chapter 3, verses 1 through 16, Amen. where Peter and John go and heal someone. Now, I know what they say. They say, now, the healing, you want to notice verse 16 in particular, the healings done by Jesus proved his messianic identity. <clears throat> and what they mean by that is Jesus went and healed and proved his messiahship. Then if you take that theory strictly, it won't work when you apply it to the apostles. Now, they try to use it. They say, well, now, you see, the apostles used it to prove Jesus' messianic identity. But you see, you're already off the boat that you're on to begin with. What you're wanting to say is that there was something special about Jesus. Because if we take that one step off to the right, now watch watch this, as, as they'll allow us to do, as long as we let it happen for the apostles, the people involved in Acts 3, that they healed to prove Jesus' messianic identity, why can't we take it another step off, or really we're in the same step, we're in the same boat there, and say, well, that's why the church heals today, to prove that Jesus is Lord. What would be a problem with that then? I mean, if that's your theory to begin with, and you'll allow it to be removed or transferred over to someone besides the Messiah, the one who was proving himself, you'll let someone else prove him by healing, then why won't you let all of us prove him by healing then? Acts 3.16. Makes sense to me, folks. And here we've got faith again as well. With the lame man, what do we read? His name. I think we've got it twice here. Through faith in his name. We're talking about faith healing. Does healing come by faith or, you know, some other way? Just accidentally by the grace of God, you don't know when or how or it's just going to fall. <clears throat> no, it's a deliberate act of faith. This man, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong whom you see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. The faith that is by him. Let's go a step further. Acts 14, verses 8 to 10. A lame man in Lystra. I mean, we're way now. We're out into Paul's ministry. We're way beyond the Gospels and the original apostles. <laughs> the same heard Paul speak, who steadfastly beholding him, Paul beholding the man, and perceiving... Now, this is a crucial phrase here. that he had faith to be healed. 
You see, these little blowhards that wave their little flag, we believe in inspiration. Just a name for nothing. You're just blowing hot air when you don't believe what is written here. Amen. That's an important phrase. Paul perceived that he had faith to be healed. That means you'll meet people who don't have faith to be healed. That's it. clearly what this text is saying here. What they don't like is when we ascribe doubt or unbelief to people. They say that's destructive and cruel. We ascribe doubt or unbelief to people they would call great saints in the army of God, great man of faith, a pious, godly woman of God. We ascribe doubt or unbelief to them because they prayed for something and didn't get it. But this is a crucial phrase here. If they really believe in inspiration, every jot and tittle, like they're always claiming, they'd want to deal with it. This doesn't have anything to do with Paul or anyone. He perceived in that man faith to be healed. That's a remarkable statement. And if you remember the context of this that we covered several Friday nights ago, this is one of those pagan contexts here. This wasn't Paul preaching at a synagogue to the three groups of Jews, proselytes, or god fears where you would think they've got some knowledge, and they would have some knowledge of, of God and of the ways of God, even if it's just from the Old Testament. Most of the time it would be. Here, like over in chapter 17 with Paul at Athens, Paul at, at Lystra and, and um, Derby and Iconium and so forth, this place in Acts 14, 8-10 is a pagan city. And he perceived that this man had faith to be healed. That, that tells us a lot. That tells us that healing comes by faith. It tells us so many things. It tells us that Paul had some of the gifts of the Spirit, the word of knowledge working, that Paul could look at one man among, we don't know how many were there, could look at him and perceive by looking at the man that he had faith to be healed. <clears throat> now, I know people could say, well, the man was lame. Obviously, he needed healing. Oh, that's not what we're arguing here. Obviously, he needed healing. Did he have the faith for it, though? That's the point Luke is making here, that Paul was able to look. There surely were other sick people around. And by the gift and the ministry of the Holy Spirit, perceived this man, now this, 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 and this doesn't have faith, this man has faith to be healed. Just from the short teaching that Paul had given. And you can, if you're like me, but just feel ashamed of the church who has heard the word of God for centuries upon centuries and has no more faith, not even the faith, of this poor soul right here, who had heard his first Christian message, seen his first Christian demonstration, didn't even get through the message, just heard a few of the initial words of Paul, miracle of miracles, and somehow the man had faith to be healed. Maybe it goes to that, back to that old analogy that we'll be looking at with regard to Americanism, Christianity, and secularism in our studies in Christian ethics of inoculation, that people have just heard too much, too much, too much. I think when you hear too much and you don't do it, you don't live it, then it kills your soul. It kills your ability to perceive. So here's a man who thanked God heard at one time and didn't turn his back on it. Perceived he had faith to be healed. Paul said with a loud voice, Stand upright on thy feet. And he leaped and walked. Now you can either believe me or Lewis, or you can either believe Lewis or Matthew. I almost, I, see, I'm keeping myself on the opposite side of Lewis. I'll stay with Matthew and Mark and Paul and the rest of them. He's lumping faith healing on the other side of something that <clears throat> is an extra addition to Christianity that is unscriptural. What are we going to do with our Christian documents then? We'll have to get out our scissors and paste as they often do. Rearrange things, write in our own denominational precepts here in order to explain all of this away. <clears throat> And you know, after all, what's the purpose in writing a lot of material like this? It really tickles the ears, jacuzzi religion, it even has a tickling title to it, hot tub religion. I don't know that Packer or some of these guys make a lot of money from this. Uh, maybe Packer makes more than others because some of his books, a lot of his aren't technical. They're written on a popular level, so more people will buy them. But if nothing else, it builds a name for yourself <clears throat> in the community of the church and theologians. And they just go on and on and on and on writing. And oftentimes it seems like it's just tickling the ears because they're really not doing what they're saying ought to be done here. You remember an article I read some time ago about that decadent chocolate cake? You remember that was written by Packer also. And he had a rather, it was entitled Decadence a la mode, about that decadent chocolate cake. 
And he had a rather um, good critique, very barbed critique of all of the worldliness and paganism and secularism that's found in the church today. Very good barbed critique of that. Well, someone wrote a letter to the editor about that decadent chocolate cake. And here's what he had to say. This is Mr. Fred A. from Shelton, Washington. Thanks for J.I. Packer's column on the decadent chocolate cake, Decadence a la mode, October the 2nd issue. As I was reading it, I was thinking, the world squeezes us into its mold. That's what Packer was arguing there. The world squeezes us into its mold. Then at the end, the article, Packer wonders if we are wondering if he had any of that cake. You remember that? Well, for one, I wasn't wondering. So I'm wondering why he was